Welcome, everybody, to the University of Applied Research and Development, our educators podcast. I'm delighted to have Dr. Lee with us, who is an educational psychologist. She's also an educational technologist and an instructional designer with Notre Dame as well. Welcome, Dr. Lee. Thank you. Tell us about what you're doing now, your role, and, and how it works. Well, recently I'm doing quite a bit more uh, with this, uh, you know, uh, all the verbs that we use and adjectives, uh, unprecedented shift uh, to online learning uh, in the K through 12 sector. Um, uh, as far as consultancies go, I've been doing quite a bit more in that area as, sh as schools uh, navigate how to, um, you know, address that shift. Um, and in addition, uh, continuing my work in higher education with faculty members, uh, really helping them to design integrated courses and, um, you know, inclusive courses in the online and face-to-face -face and hybrid settings. Now, that word inclusive, tell us about how you do that with instructional design. Yes, um, I am a strong advocate of uh, uni universal design for learning um, guidelines and principles and incorporating that into uh, a design work and design flow. Um, it really does involve, um, you know, a more proactive um, attempt at reaching all learners. If you think about it, in the education field, we're all very familiar with differentiation and, you know, the different ways that we can differentiate, but that really is more of a uh, responsive um, way of designing a course, right? Because we get the data about our students and then we're adjusting content process or some, uh, you know, all the other elements of differentiation. Well, universal design for learning really flips that on its head and instead has us think, from the start, how can we most reach the largest number of learners and their diverse learning needs and preferences? And to design that into uh, a, a course resource or assessment or you, even the trajectory of a course, the syllabus, all aspects of it. Um, so I really like to think of uh, those two pieces not as separate because sometimes we you know in our different counts we can kind of start saying like well I'm going to use DI and I'm going to use EDL we really need to use both uh, and, and then some potentially um, so that we are really meeting the needs of students um, and really uh, providing a service for them that wraps around uh, from from start to finish. So if someone's, because of the difficult and challenging situation we're in right now, particularly the majority of our educators are in Nepal, and they're still doing working from home, learning from home, um, what's mm -hmm. something, what's one or two or three principles that they could put in place as they're designing learning experiences for students? Uh, I would say really... Um, to each, to, to any educator who's really, you know, navigating that working from home and, and remote learning, um, tapping your, your students and your, your student population, because it's going to be different, you know, from place to place and even potentially from school to school. So um, really identify, you know, what are the students' um, technological needs? What do they have available to them? And then you'll need to really craft uh, your strategy for reaching those students um, based on, you know, their accessibility to, to Wi-Fi. Uh, do they have the devices that are in, needed and in place? Um, you know, how um, often are they able to get on? Is asynchronous a better model or is synchronous? You know, depending on your student population, the age level, the, the developmental needs. Uh, it might look very different from classroom to classroom, grade level to grade level even. Um, so it really takes um, uh, the teacher getting in contact with that teaching and learning context and the shifts that have happened and then what are the challenges and barriers uh, that students may be facing in, in, as they are attempting to learn, you know, um, it remotely. And, and for some of our students, they never anticipated that. So, you know, it's like they, they have even more of a need for scaffolding and supports uh, because it might have been their preferred modality to be face-to-face. -face. So how can we bridge that and make sure that they're getting uh, their needs met for the social and emotional engagement? I think schools have probably focused on what are the needs of teachers, who, who has a good Wi-Fi connection and who has a, like a webcam so they can do these things, that, that next stage of identifying with the students what their needs are, that's, that's really important. Thank you for bringing that up. Tell us about your doctorate. I'd love to hear about what you did and how you did it. 
Yes. Um, so my doctorate was uh, through the uh, University of California, Irvine and uh, California State uh, University, Los Angeles. It was a joint uh, doctoral program in uh, educational leadership. And I was very proud to be one of the last cohorts to go through that uh, joint program. I really liked it because I had access to UC, University of California, and California State University resources and faculty. And that was an amazing experience. Um, I uh, actually focused my work on, um, my dissertation title was The Human Fallout, uh, Educators' Perspectives About No Child Left Behind Implementation in Urban Schools. And, um, you know, this was uh, just as uh, No Child Left Behind was uh, rolling out. And so I really wanted to see um, how did the intended policy aims interface with the lived experiences of educators who were serving in urban environments and uh, found quite a, 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 a bit of information, did individual um, meetings and focus groups, so it's, it's qualitative uh, research. Um, and uh, just hearing their perspectives and learning from them and um, being able to represent that because I think sometimes when we make policy, it's very dis, uh, it, it can be very disconnected to um, the experiences that people that, you know, uh, um, live through the policy may have and sometimes that voice isn't heard. So I really sought to elevate the voices of teachers uh, in urban settings and, you know, to identify, you know, um, what did they see? How did it impact, uh, you know, their ability to serve students? Um, what did they foresee as a result of, you know, this um, implementation of the policy and, and, and how it might impact students and communities long into the future? So did it work? <laughs> Well, the, the outlook, um, you know, the educators at that time, uh, it was, there was, there were many concerns. And I think that we are seeing those concerns manifested now um, and, uh, and communities and, and, and schools and uh, uh, really um, starting to, to um, ask for, and, and, and now with the pandemic, this is making it even more so, a focus on holistic education. Um, and, and, and de-emphasis of, uh, of testing. Uh, we've seen some really amazing changes take place uh, related to that in higher education and the importance of the SAT. And um, I think uh, even some uh, colleges and universities have said they're not even gonna look at those types of tests. Um, so it's a, a lot of things are going on around, around that and, and the fatigue uh, that some of the teachers had uh, expressed that they were concerned about the potential for fatigue and you know, models in use in other countries uh, that were um, a little more sustainable and uh, humanistic uh, from their viewpoint, um, you know, with the where testing, the standardized testing wasn't so strongly emphasized. Hmm. So, from the teachers' perspective, was did they feel they had an opportunity to give feedback into the policy machine? Yeah, that was one of the things that was mentioned quite often. That 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 it was felt that decisions were made about education, about those who were very disconnected, you know. Um, I, I would often mention, you know, well, there were, you know, like focus groups and, you know, committees convened and they had, you know, teachers of the year represented on those and so forth. Um, but the perception was that, you know, teachers that were really on the ground and in those urban settings, they, they didn't feel that their voices um, were included. And, and therefore, you know, there were so many concerns around, um, um, special, edu uh, special education, um, how the impact uh, of, of this would, you know, what it would have uh, for students um, and English language learners and, you know, all of those, those uh, groups that we know are in need of extra supports, uh, the, there was strong teacher concern about how these, these changes would impact the students. And, and I think it, it, it's ongoing, right, as, as we're now navigating um, you know, different uh, learning environments with the shift to remote learning. Um, you know, we have those, those concerns emerging again, you know, and this, in this um, I'm hoping will stick a, a want to return to a more holistic form of learning um, and, you know, really whole person, whole body um, um, and, and, and inclusive of the languages and cultures and interests that students come to the classroom with. I think what I've, what I've taken from our conversation is the importance of feedback. Feedback from learners, 
about their needs and maybe the barriers that are going to stop them from fully participating, feedback from teachers to the policy machine about you know, what really works in the, pl in the classroom, what works in communities to enable students to learn. Tell us about some of the consulting that you do and what you do with corporations, organizations, communities. Yes. Uh, so right now, the bulk of my consultancy work really is focused on um, the distance learning components. Um, so I uh, have been working with districts and schools, um, training their teacher trainers uh, to get ready for the fall semester, uh, which is looking different in different places. Uh, but in ev almost every instance involving some component of online learning. Um, and so there's a lot of need around that area. Um, you know, how do I effectively teach online? Um, how do I um, use the tools? There's, there's so many tools available and we're getting inundated literally with emails from companies and apps and, you know, all of these things. How do I sort through, you know, what are the best tools for formative and summative assessment, uh, for student engagement, um, you know, uh, for really organizing a unit of study in the online setting where, I'm, where I may not be seeing my students, you know, uh, in a, on a regular basis or at all. Um, how do I build community with my class in a, on a computer? And so, you know, and, and there's a strong perception um, that I often hear is, you know, it's just not possible. It's a computer, it's cold. And so really, you know, helping to share what are some of the engagement tools, you know, that are embedded in different platforms and resources, and how can we really have that human connection uh, through a computer screen? Uh, it's definitely possible with the right training and right tools. And so that's where I'm kind of bridging that understanding and, and two, that we cannot simply just do what we were doing online. It, it just doesn't transfer over that way. So we have to make some fundamental shifts in the ways that we do things and design is a big part of that. Uh, it, there's a big initial um, effort and time commitment, but then you'll find once you have that and once you have an understanding of how these different pieces work, um, it's, it's much easier. You're, you're oftentimes just revising a template that you've made in, in an instance or, you know, once you kind of get your base materials, you can run with it. And so I'm really strongly emphasizing with teachers and, and districts uh, collaboration in virtual learning communities of teachers. I'm so excited for this moment because now we have a chance to do that. Those of us who've been in online, like that's been, you know, we, we've been promoting it and saying it and like, yes, it would be great if we could make these distributed, you know, connections across countries with educators and, you know, who are doing innovative, immersive experiences for their students. Well, now that we're all kind of here, <laughs> you know, it's a great opportunity to start building those networks and communities um, and, and, and putting in place the structures and supports um, that can take us through, um, you know, even beyond uh, this, the, the pandemic situation that we find ourselves in. It's a terrible situation for the world and communities and individual families to go through. On the other side, as you say, it's the, it's the impetus to make mm -hmm. changes that schools and individual educators have been um, just hesitant to do, hesitant to jump in because of maybe the upskill or just the fear of the unknown. And so I think that many positive changes for organizations like schools have have been forced to happen at this time one of the exciting things that i heard um, last week with one of our educators in nepal is students taking over breakout rooms and i think that's one of the biggest innovations that people don't talk about the biggest opportunities for collaboration communication for creativity and students working together are the breakout rooms so this, the senior educator was telling me about just she was dropping into different breakout rooms with her students and just sitting there in awe of watching these students sharing their screens, showing their work, using Google Docs to make notes with each other. But they were just having a conversation and the technology wasn't a barrier. They didn't. They didn't have to morph how they were behaving for the tech. They used the tech to fit the process that they were going through. And that's nothing that she had told them to do. She hadn't said, you must share a screen, you must collaborate. They had automatically started taking on roles and responsibilities and having this interaction. It was wonderful. I was, I was delighted to hear this coming from her and these experiences. And these are students in Nepal. So it's a developing nation, lots of challenges, 
but they don't see it like that. They just see we're going to do this, we're going to give it a go and make the maximum benefit we can. I think there's going to be stories that are going to position developing nations that are going to surprise more developed nations um, so they can lead the way, I think. Just before we finish, Dr. Lee, I'd love for you to give um, our educators that are in the program or anyone that's watching maybe some career advice or career tips as they move through their education leadership journey. What would you say to someone to position themselves well for success going forward? Yes. Um, on this, I would say, you know, uh, stay connected. Stay connected. Um, don't um, permit um, physical or social distancing to cause you to feel that you're all by yourself or alone. Um, we're all here together um, for now and beyond. So um, really keeping those connections active, uh, being creative about the ways that you do it is key. Um, I would say also keep improving, keep training. Um, Sometimes as we progress through our careers, you know, and especially as you're in an educational leadership program, you may feel like exhausted once you make it to the finish line, right? Like, whew, I made it through. And you just want to kind of step back and take a little break. But I encourage you to stay engaged. Stay engaged with your learning communities. Stay engaged with your cohorts. See what your peers are doing long after the program ends. Uh, you may be surprised uh, at the things that you will find and the resources that you will find as you each step out into your fields and begin to actively serve communities, uh, the different connections that you can make with each other um, and your resources, bringing them together to best serve the communities that you are serving. Keep a service mindset. Uh, that's key. Remain humble. Uh, know what you don't know and, and what you need to learn and make steps to keep learning and keep growing and keep moving. You know, right now there's a lot of focus um, in the world about, you know, civic engagement and awareness and equity and fairness. And so let's seize upon that and, and take it with momentum um, to just keep driving forward to greater equity for all. And we do that not by staying in our silos, you know, or just doing our individual work, but the inv individual work is important. So we need to do that, but we also need to do collective work. Um, and that's how we will affect and transform our world for the better. Love that. So stay connected, keep learning, have a service mindset, and do collective work. Yes. Awesome. Love it. Hey, Dr. <laughs> Lee, I really want to thank you for your time. Thank you for doing this. I know you're really busy serving the state, the university, and lots of other consulting that you do. So thanks very much for sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you, Craig. Happy to share anytime. <laughs>